Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the panel on celebrating uh, Botswana journeys in real estate. Let me introduce my next panelist, Raymond Puluki Mohobe, who is the founder and CEO at Mohobe Incorporated. I think one of the top podcasters in our country as well in the moment. He's a visionary entrepreneur with an impressive educational background, holding an LLB Bachelor of Laws from the University of Botswana and a Master of Laws in International Trade and Banking Law from Washington College of Law in the United States of America. Additionally, he attained a Diploma in Property Investment from Vince University and a Diploma in Alternative Dispute Resolution. As the CEO and founder of Mohobe Incorporated and a senior attorney and founding partner at the Mohobe Legal Practitioners, he has proven himself a successful business leader and that's why he's sitting over there. Mr. Mohobe is also a respected investor in stocks and real estate as well as the founder of Angel Networks Botswana. That's something I want to touch on in our conversation. He's dedicated to mentoring others and shares his expertise as a speaker and author. And incidentally, he's got a book that's coming out in the next how many months? Next few weeks. The next few weeks, so be on the lookout for that one. Furthermore, he is known for his philanthropic efforts and serves as a headman. His motto, infuse, inspire, energize, and empower. Mr. Mpuluki Mohobe demonstrates a passion for making an impact, a positive impact in various fields. And this is why many of us will know his Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. I'm going to get straight into the questions, and I'll ask this one, uh, same question to both Remo uh, Khobi and Bemba Khobi. You first, Remo Khobi. Can you describe the moment that you first decided or realized that real estate is for you? I mean, you're a lawyer by profession, and this is why I asked this question. Uh, to be honest, it was, uh, it was more like I was pushed into it. I had a, a particularly difficult landlady. Um, she would come to me asking for an advance. I give it to her. Two weeks later, we have a big argument. She's asking for money again. And um, I it got to a point when I said, you know, enough of this. I should have my own property. So it went in 1993. I bought my first property to be 100% honest. To get out of that situation, and luckily at the time, time projects were offloading some of their properties at Color View. So I approached, uh, not to give a Sandy Kelly, one of Sandy Kelly's partners, and um, and uh, the rest is history. I bought, I bought that uh, piece of real estate, which was a house, three bedroom house, for 180,000. 1993. Yes. How old is a person 193 right now? Thirty years. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's, let's let's take it back to the early nineties. Um, I won't say how old I was in ninety two and ninety three. Um, but yeah, um, that first deal, uh, um, hundred and eighty thousand time project is is offloading. Um, what was the big sort of realization? about yourself as a person um, in that deal being the very first property deal ever? Well, I was lucky to realize that I could negotiate because at the time they were not initially happy about uh, getting paid in installments. <coughs> so as a lawyer, a practicing lawyer at the time, I <coughs> by the name of Gudu Waria, who is now a, a judge of the Court of Appeal. And, uh, because of the relationship I had with my neighbor to negotiate to accept payment by installment. So um, I realized from that first deal that negotiations really matter. Um, it's not about price, it's about uh, the deal in terms of the value that you are getting and the terms of the deal. And I later discovered now when I got into what I call beast mode in terms of really accelerating my efforts, that uh, negotiation uh, is a very important component of the real, the real estate because um, it actually took me about 10 years to get serious about becoming an investor. Because the first 10 years I was quite happy being 
trying to be the best lawyer there is and you know, pushing litigation and debt collection and all that and establishing what came to be one of the largest indigenous law practices in the country. And then 10 years later there was a pivot where it wasn't just law, it was actually acquisition of real estate and development of real estate stands that we're doing simultaneously as we actually split my time between the courts and the sites. And that's how we transitioned over the next 10 years. Now, now let me ask you this quickly. That realization you made uh, about the importance of negotiation, what impact did it have on you building your law firm? I think it was a, it was a, it was a, um, you know, a game changer because it then thrust me into a posture of personal development. If you watch some of my uh, videos on, 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 on my, some of my, um, my platforms, you see that there's an emphasis on what I'm trying to teach young, upcoming developers <coughs> and mentees the importance of avid leadership. Because I then got into avid leadership, I was reading at the rate of one book a week, and uh, the folks at uh, Exclusive Books would know that I used to come there quite often to get a book. And that really made the difference. And, and, and then it now became laser focused, became, became one of my icon in terms of focusing on natural growth. So that's, that's, that's really what made it. So no social life? Huh? No social life? There was. I was oh. a married guy. I was oh. married. Right, right. So I was, I, I didn't hear mom of me complain, but I've never been on the Okay. Uh, Marco, let me come to you. All right. And, and same question to you, Remo. Your biggest challenge um, in, in real estate, and how did you push through that? Yeah, I always say to my mentees that the biggest piece of real estate that you have is really the one you have between your ears in terms of your thinking and your mentality. Because really, that's, where, that's what matters the most. And for me, I was petrified of that, to be honest. And as it happens, and I'm glad I have a uh, episode here, my first deal, which I did in 06 with a bank, because before 06, I was just focused on, on, on cash deals and generating money myself and finding ways of, of, of creating the real estate wealth myself. But I think um, Gatunso and a few other people who helped me in giving that first deal in my car, our first major mall, which is my home mall in time, and they helped us finance that. So, you know, when you when you grow up, you're, you know, you're, you're told that, uh, you know, borrowers are slaves to lenders, and that kind of thinking, and in the good book, there's somewhere where I put lending, and I borrow your money is discarded. So that kind of thinking for me was the biggest shift. And then, of course, I've had battles in the courts with, um, other players in the market, which I, um, I prefer to keep out of this forum. But, but there have been other challenges which have had to be settled in the courts um, related to some real estate ventures that, that went south, or nearly went south, but for those collections. So, um, so really for me, that was the biggest switch to embrace the idea that there's such a thing as a good debt and that a real estate debt where the numbers have been properly crunched and analyzed uh, constitutes a good debt. But of course, where you go wrong on the numbers, that's a terrible debt that is going to, that might actually bring it down. Right. Uh, Remo, yes, sir. Uh, you've done a number of projects. Um, what was your favorite one, and why was it your favorite one? Well, it's, it's like choosing between your children. It's a very dangerous thing to do. Um, the, uh, we, we play in different uh, markets. I mean, we have multi residentials, mainly in Maum, and then we, we play a lot in the industrial space. But commercial is where we have the largest number of uh, units. Um, and I think an in interaction with commercial um, tenants um, has over the years been very, very good. I mean, I've had tenants who I've started with where they were really, really struggling. Uh, one case in point, which is now going a little viral on the internet, is my interview with Shinga Boy. Shinga Boy started with us literally as a small boy in terms of, of business in Habani. And then 
he came, he grew with us, and we were able to accommodate him during COVID. After COVID, he came to me and said, can I take a larger space, another space for you, and we were able to grow with him. So it's always good to have one or two tenants like that who, um, who impact you, with whom you are able to grow. But generally, um, I'm not able to choose my favorites. But, uh, but I think the commercial space is really good for us. Okay. For the sake of time, I'll, I'll let you off on this one. Uh, remember your favorite project or deal that, that you were involved in and, and why, uh, if you can, choose between your, your children. Why was that one uh, your favorite one? Um, my favorite project is uh, Kenya around the country. Um, it was my favorite because uh, not many people uh, can do that well. The specialized um, um, things or furniture that we do. And um, I have a joy that we really love traveling around the country, but I have a joy to do it. All right, okay. Uh, I'll always ask you know, the two sides of the coin for the, for the sake of balance here. Um, if you could do any one of your deals or developments over, which one would it be and what would you do differently this time? Knowing what you know today. Um, there was a time when I was uh, very fixated on. Uh, just the numbers only. And uh, I wasn't too concerned with structure and appearance too much. But uh, some of my employees said they started complaining about the appearance of a slum landlord type of setup and the, the need to avoid Matoroko and things like that. So there's one or two Matoroko that we have. Uh, that I'm thinking that maybe I shouldn't have. But um, when you see the cash flow, when you see the cash flow where maybe your average yield is 10, uh, 12 percent, and fighting over a cap rate of 10 percent on most of your deals, and the drop of your yield is pump over 20 percent, <laughs> and you have a struggle in your mind. So, in as much as my employees are. Uh, we don't like the idea of which confirms those tenants, my CEO, those dubious tenants. But I just say, look at the numbers. Yeah. So, so it's a difficult thing in terms of deciding which one I would invest completely. Because it has benefited you in terms of cash flow. But maybe your reputation, from the point of view of your employees and some of your, you know, being in the market has taken a little bit of a dent. You have a bit of a slum, long, long, You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so it's, it's difficult. I, I, I get that. And, and, and <coughs> what then? Let's talk about the Matoro. Because, yeah, that's where you, know, you have the best yields. Right. right? But um, if, if you were to redevelop or develop those properties again, what would you do differently? It's, it's, you just have to probably clean it up and start again. But then you will be looking at pristine finishes, nice finishes. I feel for the current market, you won't get those yields, you won't yeah. get those returns. Forget about it. So there's so always a trade off. Yeah, so there's no simple trade off. But if you get to a point at which I'm getting to where I'm saying, look, I don't want to be associated with anything this dude gets, I might just say, look, if you lose the money and the returns and just wipe this off and start again, but I haven't used that spot. No, I don't think you know. But thankfully, thankfully for, for me, it's a very, very small percentage of our portfolio, very tiny percentage. Right. Uh, Mbwango, same question to you. If you could, which one would you redo your deals uh, or projects or anything that you're involved in, and how would you do it differently this time? Um, from my big collection, Yes, I've uh, had challenges in some of them, um, but what I've gained from those from those challenges is growth. Um, I've grown. I I look at this from a different perspective, and um, 
and then the day like for me the challenge comes to make a better person for the So no two overs. Okay. Mr. Holloway, you've been involved as a financier in a number of deals. If you could, which one? And you've done a few. Which one uh, would you do or when? What would you do? How, how would you do it differently? Um, I will answer like a politician. <laughs> <laughs> I will really look at all of them and redo really them. Uh, probably because I think in property you keep learning. And even when you think you've given uh, the best structure, the best solution to the client, three years later or ten years later you reflect, you realize that you could have done better. So every year you realize that you could have enhanced the previous year. Not necessarily believe that it was a right deal, but just to improve the client's cash flow and also just to drive that sustainability. Alright, I want to ask one more question and then uh, open up to the floor. Um, if there are no questions, I still have plenty more, no problem. Um, but I want to I ask this question, and, and, and you know, it's, it's one that's been playing in my mind for, for a good number of years. Right? Now, I'll set a bit of context. Um, you look at the cost of construction, I mean, someone was up here this morning talking about after COVID, you know, the price of steel has gone up by some 40%. We all know where the price of cement is right now. We know where the price of bricks are. Everything is just so much more expensive. But as a, as a, as a property uh, entrepreneur, you look at it and think, but where are the rentals? Have they moved? Are they moving, right? So my question to all three of you, is real estate, Mobile still a lucrative investment or profitable business? And hesitatingly, yes. Um, if you look at the the trajectory in Botswana in terms of how property has uh, has grown, even from a perspective of land banking, I'll give one example of uh, ten and a half hectare we acquired in 1998. We bought it for twenty six thousand, um, and we did nothing except put up a fence. Now, when I valued it recently, it was worth 10 and a half million. That is value that is simply been created by holding on to that asset and doing little else. And then if you look at the rentals and how they have grown over the years, um, and how uniquely the Botswana market has performed, while our South African brethren have been crying, and when you look at the vacancies, in the center area and things like that, um, uh, you see that the Botswana market, because the right of them, has remained resilient. And we get research from some of entities such as uh, Smart Value, that does some research. Uh, we've invested in, in that entity, by the way, as uh, Andrew Network Botswana. And the, uh, I think they, they, they said that the, the Demand for residential in the zone is something like 80,000 um, residential accommodation at that time, it was about two years ago, and it's increasing every year. So the demand is massive, and what is needed is for development to keep going. The, 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 the system that we have adopted at Mokobe, um, Mokobe Incorporated, group of companies is to ensure that at any given time we are developing because where it's, where it is tough, when it is tough to, uh, to acquire, we ensure that we are acquiring and developing at the same time. When it is tough to acquire, we concentrate on development because with development it's easier to develop and not be too concerned about about the money because we can develop from our cash flow sometimes. And then when it's, the market is changes, we focus on acquisitions. So that model that for us over the last 15, 20 years has worked in such a way that we are able to grow on an annual basis and increase our units, the number of units on an annual basis, regardless of what's happening. We try to ignore uh, CNN for a little bit and <laughs> CNN, some of the terrible things that happen. If you, my attitude is that when the world ends, it will end. That's fine. But when it doesn't end, then it keeps going. So 
you prepare for the perseverance that you don't have. Even when the, uh, there's gloom and doom around COVID and whatnot, you try to sort that on and keep growing the portfolio regardless. I feel like I should have added a caveat to my question. Uh, just give it a little bit on your answer. Maybe my question should have been, is it still a lucrative investment or profitable business for someone starting out? Your answer makes me think that you have that luxury because you built up, right? And it's taken time and, and, and sacrifice a lot. Then you should join my mentorship program. Because I left one time to take you TP to TP uh, and to take you to walk you through the initial baby steps. And then hopefully you can replicate some of the things that I did. And then the answer is again, yes. something yes. Okay, okay. Your So I'm going to ask each one of our panelists, and, and again, um, from your different perspectives, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, you know, given today's dynamics and environment and uncertainty and all of those things, uh, what advice would you give to someone starting out uh, in real estate as an entrepreneur? Well, I tell them the following, that listen, we're all in the same boat, we're not taught finance, it's not part of our curriculum. We can lament that situation as much as we want. We are, as Botswana, most the first generation entrepreneurs. We are disadvantaged in many ways. But after you finished uh, crying and lamenting it, then what? Um, first of all, Dedicate yourself to learning the craft. Listen to Malcolm Gladwell when he talks about investing your 10,000 hours, put in the time, find a mentor, get into podcasts, and forgive me if I'm biased, I recommend more than negative. <laughs> <laughs> um, where I interview the, the cream de la cream of real estate professionals in this country. And I've discovered that there are so many experts in this country in that field. Um, and then if you don't like that one, there are so many others. There's bigger pockets, there are so many others. And then get into the habit of readership. For me, avid readership made a difference. If you don't like uh, reading the physical book, we have audio books. But to me, you need to devote some time and be, as I used the word earlier, monomaniacal about it and set aside at least 30 minutes or such a day to learning the craft and to devoting yourself to the craft. And the chances are that you're going to win. Everyone, without exception, who's done that has won in this market, has won in real estate. But you first have to devote that time and attention to the learning and to the financial learning that is necessary. And that is how we're going to end our panel discussion. Not because we want to, but because uh, time is the enemy. Uh, gentlemen, lady, thank you so, so much for coming up here and uh, sharing your insights, sharing your knowledge, sharing your experience. Um, I hope there will be people from uh, the audience who will engage you.